So, over the past few days, I've been playing the Steel Division 2 beta, and I wanted to share my thoughts on it, and maybe see if it's something that you were interested in. So, just to cover our bases, this game comes out on May 2nd, and in the run-up to launch, Eugen Systems, the developers, are running interstitial betas to gather feedback for anyone who's pre-ordered. So, if you pre-ordered, and you, you can play it now during the beta phases for a few days each week. So, what's the game all about? Well, Steel Division 2 is a World War II RTS game from the makers of the War Game series. They're using that engine that was developed for the game Ruse about 10 years ago, I think, as some of you might remember. It's known for its scale, being able to zoom all the way out and have a high-level view of what's going on on a sort of aerial photo map, and then zoom all the way down into the individual soldier if you want. It's really impressive, just from a technical standpoint, and it's really detailed considering the scale. So Steel Division 2 is the sequel to Steel Division Normandy 44. Normandy 44 focused on the Western Front and historical divisions that took place there. There was US, Canada, Brits, France and other country specific divisions. Steel Division 2 focuses on the Eastern Front, notably around Operation Bagration, which was a huge Soviet offensive in the summer of 1944 that ultimately pushed the Germans back. So while Steel Division 2 does just focus on Germany versus Soviets, if you own the first game, you'll get to use 8 of the divisions from Normandy 44, and if you didn't own the first game, you can get this in a DLC pack called the Back to War pack on launch day if you want. Now personally, I feel like it's a bit of a shame that this has been separated at all. It might have been nice just to have everything carry over to game 2, or if everything was just added to game 1 as a big expansion DLC, but here we are nevertheless. So the game itself has a big single player component this time around. We haven't really seen anything from it, which to me is a bit of a worry. I mean, there's only a month to go, and we haven't seen a major component of the game. But from the description of it and a few little gifts we've seen, it does sound really amazing. There's a tactical campaign map that's turn-based. You can build up your battalions and assault forces and move them around the map with complete freedom. You then choose what towns you want to capture and fight other battalions and armies as you encounter them. You can even auto-resolve battles or fight them out. It's basically Total War World War II, essentially, which I mean sounds really cool. But again, we don't know much about it, and not sure how you actually build your forces or what you do in terms of economy and stuff like that, but the developers describe it as being highly replayable, so hopefully it is as dynamic and interesting as a Total War campaign. So let's focus on what we do know, and that's the battles themselves, skirmish and multiplayer. So in this recent round of beta, we had four divisions to play with on three maps, and I believe in the full game, there's going to be 18 divisions and 25 maps, so quite a lot to learn. And just for some context, it took me about three days of playing just to really learn the intricacies of one division. I'm still getting to grips with what I'm coming up against. Now essentially, this game is deeply rooted in historical accuracy, and there's a ton of depth when it comes to just choosing your division. It's actually really intimidating when you're first doing it because of the overwhelming amount of information given to you. So you can choose a division and go with a pre-made deck if you want to make things easier, or you can customize the division to change it a bit. Now divisions are preset for the types of units they have and for their strengths and weaknesses. Now for instance, the 5th Panzer Division has a big focus on tanks. You can still bring infantry, but you won't be able to field as much, and the cost of adding more and more infantry will get greater as you're sort of going against the grain. And of course, the Panzer Division will also have unique tank capabilities compared to, say, an infantry division, so you want to play to its strengths. Now, if people want and they like this game, I might do a guide of getting started, choosing your divisions, customizing them a bit. I'm only myself just getting over that hump of learning it, but I've got a few of my own ones now, and I've been winning with them lately, so I'm feeling pretty good about them. As I said, it is pretty intimidating, as at first, anyway, as they're huge there is a pretty huge learning curve if you're not already very knowledgeable about the history of these units and the tanks especially. So if we get a decent amount of support and ask, you know interest for it in the comments then I'll do it. Before we get into the actual moment to moment combat I just want to explain the phases very quickly. Now in a typical game phases progress from A to B to C and then each one lasts about 10 minutes. During the A phase you can only bring in A phase units and you'll have a set income amount during that phase that ticks every one minute. When B phase kicks in, your income changes to your B phase amount, and you can bring both A and B units in. Then when the C phase occurs, the same happens, and you can get A, B, and C units. Your unit pools are limited, and you will run out eventually. It's not like Company of Heroes where you can just keep fielding things as long as the game is going. This is much more realistic, and your division is limited, and you can know your limits. For instance, I had just four AA guns in one of my custom divisions, and when they got destroyed, my anti-air was gone forever. So it's much more punishing in that regard, but it is kind of a risk-reward when building your division of where you want to place your strengths. 
Unlike Steel Division Normandy 44, this time you have much more freedom with the deck building system and you can set phases of the units for when they come in. So the trade-off is usually numbers here. If you want to bring in Tiger tanks at phase A, then you could only bring in two. But if you wanted to bring them in at phase C instead, you could bring in eight. But obviously during a game it takes 20 minutes to get to that phase, so it's obviously a trade-off. It's pretty interesting. So when in battle, you have the first initial deployment phase. You lay out your troops, you tell them where do you want them to move, and then the battle begins and they go there. When troops first arrive in battle, they're usually in transport vehicles, and when they get to the front line, you can unload them. This is probably the only unrealistic thing in the entire game, which is that transport vehicles just disappear. Now I'm totally fine with this, I just thought it should be mentioned, in case anyone's wondering why that happens. I think certain German divisions or mechanized divisions keep their transports for later, and you can just hop back in them and move somewhere else, which is pretty cool, but it's seriously micro-intensive to do that. So the main game mode in Steel Division 2 sees you fighting for map control points. There's a huge dynamic border that moves and shifts around based on the weight of the units pushing on it. So if you push a large offensive of troops in a direction, the border will bulge in that direction until resistance is met and it starts to push back. Then whoever holds more capture points starts a ticking timer to win the game. Now if they're pushed back, the timer resets to zero and a stalemate occurs. But as I said before, divisions are limited, eventually you're gonna thin out somewhere. This means battles can last a fairly lengthy time, usually about 20 to 30 minutes from my experience, but sometimes it can go as long as 40 or more if both sides are particularly defensive in nature. Game settings can be adjusted, however, to increase income rates and change phase time, so you could have longer or shorter games if you wished. Now this is slightly different to Steel Division 44, as map capture points are the focus of the game rather than just the border. The enemy could have huge spearhead in the front line with lots of kind of territory, but unless they're actually occupying a control point, it doesn't matter. And while the shifting border is cool, it's also a bit of a giveaway of where things are. I think probably by design, but it's a little strange. I mean, you see a big bulge pressing somewhere and you know there's something there. So it makes big surprise ambushes a bit hard to pull off, but smaller ambushes obviously still work. And the benefit to the border is pincer moves and things of that nature. If you close your border around the enemy, they take a big morale hit for being cut off. And they may just surrender if a bit of pressure is put on them. Now speaking of pressure, every unit in the game has a stress meter. When they receive a lot of fire, this meter builds up, and when it reaches the max amount they become pinned and they won't really fire back. You can force retreat them if they're like this, and they'll attempt to run back to safety, or you can just leave them and hope that they recover. Things like artillery, air attacks, and prolonged combat skirmishes raises their stress level even if it's just nearby. You know, mortars don't directly even have to hit them. So units can kind of become pinned quite easily. And if the enemy surround or rush pinned units, they'll often just surrender. The other big focus is line of sight. The distances covered in Steel Division 2 are vast. Most tanks' main gun have a range of about 2,000 meters. They then have suppression, blast radiuses, penetration damage, front, side, back, and top armor, as well as close range weapons with all their own stats, gun rotation speeds, and all of that. They also have optics levels, so while a tank might not be able to see 2000 meters directly, if you can get some recon units with high optics, then you can have your tanks find their targets at range. Now, as I said, line of sight is king in this regard, and with Steel Division 2, there's a bigger focus on terrain elevation. Now, big hills play an important role, as tanks can kind of get on them and fire over tree lines, but they can't fire down the base of the hill, so there's really interesting dynamics going on there. With the line of sight tool, you can always see what type of coverage an area has, and find the sweet spots that you need for AT guns to cover, or perhaps areas that you might want to smoke to block for your infantry to cross for a limited time. Range is important for infantry too. Knowing the weapons they carry and placing them at their appropriate distances means you can pin infantry at range or wait to rush a tank at close range to throw grenades or use flamethrowers or whatever it might be. There's nothing more satisfying than seeing a tank move close to your tree line, you know that they haven't really got great optics and you just have your infantry lying in wait. I say that, there's actually a few things that are quite satisfying. A good air cluster bomb is usually pretty good and watching the Katusha rocket batteries are pretty amazing as well.
Speaking of air, air combat is pretty simple. You just send planes in from off the map and there's a sort of rock, paper, scissors system going on with bombers, fighters and anti-air ground units. But as with everything in Steel Division, there's multiple types of bombers, ground attack fighters, dog fighters, recon planes, tank busters and all sorts. There's a lot of variety in the air to keep track of. But planes do have a fuel and ammo amount, so they can only stay up there for so long before they need to go back to base and repair and refuel. Supply is a big deal actually, you need supply trucks to come in, even for the guys on the ground, to refuel and replenish ammo of everything you have, tanks, infantry, artillery, whatever it may be. And if tanks have sustained damage, be it their tracks could break or crew members could die or engines can stall, you need supply vehicles to reach the front line and fix them up. These vehicles are extremely valuable and can actually be stolen from the enemy if surrounded with infantry. Taking these out means that your enemy is going to be hurt for ammo and repairs and needs to call in more, and they might not even have more, so they can be really, really important. Another extremely valuable unit is the Commander. In Steel Division 2, there's both leaders and commanders. Commanders provide an experience buff to those around them, but they carry radios. If leaders are in radio range of a commander, they then get the experience buff and pass it on to the troops at the front line. So there's a really nice chain of command you can get going from a commander to the leaders to the troops. If you got it all linked up, you can drastically increase your frontline troops experience levels, but you just have to make sure your commander isn't too far forward or too vulnerable. If it also works with allies, so you can buff them if they're in radio range, and leaders can extend that range too, so you can go from commander to leader to leader to frontline troops, really creating this like network if you want. It's really fun, and it's a nice extra thing to manage and think about. So essentially, combat is a really micro-intense affair. You have these huge maps where you could be in control of anywhere between 20, 40 units at a time, maybe even more as the game progresses, constantly needing to check their lines of sight, what weapons they have for their situation, firing artillery, managing your AA guns, the air battle, tanks, infantry combat, bringing up supply, making sure commanders are in range, and then helping allies if you can. There's so much to think about all the time. In single player, you can slow time and pause, obviously, which is nice, but in multiplayer, it's a huge mess of units of what you need to manage. It's kind of weird because the game is actually really detailed, but you pretty much will never have time to zoom in. There's always something to do, and there's no benefit to zooming in, so it still looks great from above, but some of the detail is crazy with armor panels being shot off or troops holding their guns up as they cross rivers and stuff like that. It's really fun to watch it back in the replays, and it's great that the detail is there to do it, but while you're playing, I mean, the game might as well be 2D, as you're just moving icons around most of the time. But when you do zoom in, it is really satisfying to watch, and it's very quick to just snap to a unit to follow them, which is great. So that's really my time with the beta so far. I'll be reporting on that single player as soon as I get my hands on it. Now for multiplayer, I do enjoy the game. There's also another mode called Breakthrough, which I'll cover a bit later. It's basically one side defends, one side attacks, and you can build emplacements and things like that. There's also the 10v10 massive scale battles, which are really unbelievable in terms of technical feat more than anything. The first Steel Division had them as well, and the first Steel Division was really similar to this, especially if you're just kind of sitting on the outside and you don't have much experience with these games. You know, the two probably look almost identical. And that, that game kind of died off pretty quickly for multiplayer. There's no matchmaking here either, so you just pop into lobbies of custom games and you just have to hope that the players you're facing are similar skill level to make it interesting. And there's a bit of tribalism with those type of things as well, when people are telling you to bring certain things or do certain things. So, even though I feel like this game is an improvement over the first, I just have no idea if it's going to have the staying power, for multiplayer at least. I'm sure it'll always be fun with friends though. We'll have to see. My personal recommendation right now would be to pick up the first game cheap on a sale, see if you like it, and then if you want to get more, you know, get Steel Division 2 if you think you'll enjoy it. That way, you can even get to carry over some of the stuff from the first game into the second, so you're not losing out too badly. If you want to support my channel and get the game very cheap, you can of course use my CDK's affiliate link in the description. The game is 80% off there, and you can get it for like $8 or something. The first game has skirmish mode and pretty basic campaign with historical missions. Multiplayer is pretty dead in it now, but like I said, it shares 90% of the gameplay with Steel Division 2, so it's like a good taster to see if it's something you want more of. And that's it for the video, I'm hoping to upload a battle we played on stream recently and just go through the replay and kind of show off a full battle in, in kind of the moment to moment gameplay a bit better. It's 30 minutes though, so it's quite long, I'll have to see if I can maybe trim it down. But I think it will help people understand what you do in the game a bit more. If you like that, and you want to see more like these, 
please let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next one.